I have been notified that there's one more announcement. Um, the lists for the children that we provide for Christmas are now available in the um, front hall. So we hope you'll take a look and sign up and uh, get something for a children for the children in need. Thank you. There was no prophetic word from God for many long years. Yet the people, yet the people treasured ancient prophecies of a Messiah. Just as the light of one small candle can give assurance in the dark, one little word can keep hope alive. Come Lord Jesus, come and bring us hope.
Let us pray. O oh God, our righteousness, we sometimes wonder how so much can be wrong with our world and how disappointed you must be. We wait with little hope for you to come and make things right. We are eager to hear a word from you, yet we are greeted by silence. We long to see your face and we wonder how long we must remain patient. We are eager for the promised return of the Christ, the Messiah, who will restore and empower us once again. Hope is frail, but it is hard to kill. Let your light shine in our darkness and help us keep hope alive. Hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please turn to hymn number 126. taken from Jeremiah 33, verses 14 through 16. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is Our Righteousness. The second reading is from Luke 21, 25 through 28. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near.
Let's pray together. God, you are a God of righteousness, a God who wishes the world to be in order. You have a plan, and that plan includes each one of us. We don't always know what our role will be, but we ask that you help us to see to open our eyes, open our ears, and to watch for opportunities when we can be that one light shining in the darkness, restoring hope to people who are feeling hopeless. Be with us in this time together and let these words reach deeply into the hearts of each one. Amen. Well, today we are starting off with a very brief history lesson. Tradition talks about a time that we call the intertestamental period. The intertestamental period. In other words, the period of time between the end of the Old Testament, which occurred when the prophet Malachi stopped writing, around 400 BC, and it ended with the appearance of John the Baptist as an adult when he began baptizing people. So during that time, almost 400 years, there were no major prophets who arose and there were no new messages from God. No new books were added to the Hebrew Bible. This is the time between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of New Testament times. Now we're gonna go back just a little bit farther. Around 600 BC, the Babylonians captured the northern kingdom of Israel and then the southern kingdom of Judea and they took many of the people back to Babylon. Then the Persian Empire led by Cyrus the Great conquered the Babylonian Empire 70 years after the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem and they allowed the Israelites to return to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. This was called the second temple. 
The selection of sacred texts for the Jewish Bible was completed around 400 BC, around the time Malachi finished his time of prophecy. Now this land was taken over again and again. We had the Babylonians and the Persians and then the Greeks conquered the Persians and then the Egyptians took control for a brief time, then the Greeks again. There was a major rebellion held by the Maccabees in 167 BC and at that time rule returned to the native Judeans for almost 100 years. The Romans seized power in 63 BC, but in 40 BC, the Parthians, a small empire based in what we now call Iran, captured Jerusalem and appointed a king. The Romans, under King Herod, that should be a familiar name, they regained power and then they stayed in control for quite some time. Now I'm telling you this so you understand that between the Jews and the Romans, there was always tension. And a huge rebellion broke out in 66 AD. The Romans, we know, were, could be ruthless people. They destroyed Jerusalem and the second temple in 70 AD. And the rebellion ended in 73 AD after the siege of Masada, a Jewish fortress located on a flat rock plateau. Rather than being captured by the Romans, 960 Jews committed suicide inside that fortress. Well, that was probably more information than you wanted, but it's important to understand the circumstances of the times. This region was in demand because it was a crossroads for trade routes from the Near East, Arabia, Egypt, and the Mediterranean Sea. If you wanted to get your goods out into the world, you had to go through Israel. And so everybody wanted that land. The wants and needs of the Israelites were barely even considered. Rebellions all through that time were brutally cut down and any hint of an attempt to set up a Jewish king was a risk of retaliation. The people wondered if God had forsaken them completely. In fact, their history showed a pattern of the people moving away from God and then faithful worship and God withdrawing God's protection. So it was during the Babylonian exile that much of what we call the Old Testament was written down. The prophet Jeremiah wrote from Babylon about Israel's longing for a return to God's favor, a restoration of the right kind of worship, and for God to make things right again. Jeremiah is often called the weeping prophet. The first half of the book tells about the Babylonian conquest of Israel and the suffering of the people in exile. The second half of Jeremiah is God's promise to restore Israel. And our reading for this morning comes from that second half of Jeremiah. Here's what it says. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up from David. Now we're not talking about a tree, we're talking about a family tree, and that branch is a person. And he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called the Lord our righteousness. In Hebrew, this term, the name, the Lord our righteousness, is Jehovah Tzidkenu, one of the many names used in the Old Testament to refer to attributes of God. Now in your bulletin today, I included a whole big long list of the many ways that God is referred to in the Bible. And a lot of them do start with Jehovah or El, and then there's another word that includes the attribute that they were looking at. Because of course, there's no one word that encompasses all that God is. But today in this scripture, the term is Jehovah Tzidkenu, um, one of the many names that, that um, was used, meaning the Lord our righteousness. So this passage we believe is a prophecy about a Messiah. 
It says this Messiah will be of the lineage of David. The theme of this prophecy, of course, is righteousness, that God, through this Messiah, will restore justice, save the people, and rebuild Jerusalem. It's a powerful promise, one that the people could hold on to even when things seemed impossible. The promise of a Messiah was the faint glow of one small light in the dark. Well, I recently ran across this beautiful song that comes from those well-respected theologians at Disney's DreamWorks Animation Studio. It's from the 1998 movie, The Prince of Egypt, which was the story of Moses. The song is called, When You Believe, and it tells about the experience of the Hebrew people as slaves in Egypt and how they continued to pray, but wondered if their prayers were even being heard. There's one line that stands out, and it actually appeared in our invocation prayer today. It says, though hope is frail, it's hard to kill. Though hope is frail, it's hard to kill. Isn't that a good description? One single candle flame can be lit, but it continues to burn, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Well, Advent, of course, is the season of preparation for the first coming of the Christ in the person of Jesus, a real person who lived and walked among us. His birth story is what we feature at Christmas time, a mix of truth, legend, and tradition. It's recorded in the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Of course, John, being the rebellious gospel writer, doesn't include the birth narrative. He starts with John the Baptist. Since this is the year of Luke, we're starting a brand new liturgical year as of today, this is the year that we'll be talking about you about Luke, so that's the version that we're using this Christmas, the Luke account. So Advent is the coming of Jesus at Christmas, but Advent has a second meaning. It's a season of preparation for the second coming of Christ that Jesus promised his followers. Our passage from Luke today talks about this second coming. It follows Jesus' visit to the temple when he saw the poor woman putting the coins in the treasury. As they left the temple that day, Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple, a time when not one stone would be left upon another. 